Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, PCH Grand Rounds. As you may tell, uh, I am a bit under the weather and have no voice this morning, so I'm going to keep this short and sweet. Um, I am uh, honored that Dr. Osley uh, is speaking this morning. Uh, his uh, CV is way more impressive than uh, I can give credit to this morning, so I'm not uh, even going to try, but simply going to say uh, that uh, in the short time that I've come to know him uh, uh, since he's been here, he's a man that I've uh, come to respect and admire greatly. So we're, uh, we're very honored to have you this morning, Dr. Osley. Thanks, Micah. Um, uh, just some <clears throat> full disclosure, there is a, surgeons like to operate and we like to operate for the right reasons, but we, I did pick this topic uh, for pediatric grand rounds to kind of bring um, some knowledge base into where we are currently with reflux disease in, in children because uh, we've lived our lives as, as pediatricians, pediatric surgeons with an operation that I think for a long time was not a good operation. A lot of kids have had fundoplications and, and uh, you're going to see some data that they didn't do as well as, as they, we hoped or thought that they would. But hopefully by giving you the information we're going to spend the next 45, 50 minutes, you'll you'll come to a better understanding of where we're at with regard to reflux disease and how much better we can surgically treat it than we, than we were ever able to treat it before. So, uh, With that, I have no financial relationships. Uh, the objective this morning is um, to kind of share with everybody which patients are currently the patients that we as pediatric surgeons um, would benefit from um, any surgical intervention for gastroesophageal reflux disease. And then go into some of the changes that we've done in the, with regard to the operation, which have really changed the outcome and changed the quality of life of these children uh, with regard to both the reflux disease and the surgical correction of it. And then also just to kind of expand a little bit about the evidence-based care of a gastroesophageal reflux disease in the pediatric population. So to begin with, uh, for the pediatricians in the room, you guys know this better than the, than the surgical residents. So all babies reflux, right? We call it reflux, it's really chalasia of infancy. It's where they just regurgitate, it's normal. You're burping a baby and you get, you get some formula of breast milk up. It usually goes away around six or 12 months. Um, and self-limiting, there's no adverse supply. So this is not reflux, it's not, it's not gastroesophageal reflux, it's not gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's a baby that is, is doing what a baby should be doing. Then when we move on from just normal burping, wet burp stuff to now we have a child when you put you know, everything in the stomach starts to come up, we're starting to talk about gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's not just these little wet burps that we see, but it's you know, five, 10 milliliters of a feed that's now up into a burping rag or worse yet, you get into gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is the, the four things you see there. You get failure to thrive because everything you put in comes out. Um, you can have something called acute life-threatening events where a baby eats and then shortly thereafter, anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour, we'll have an event where they turn blue, become cyanotic, may become apneic. Those are the babies that end up in the emergency room because of an ambulance call and they never figure out what caused it except for you find out that they have reflux disease and we call them the ulti events. <clears throat> you have, <clears throat> excuse me. You have patients that have uh, pulmonary symptoms. These are usually... Uh, anywhere from uh, six months and older. So they reflux and they have an uh, event where they either aspirate or they have poor oropharyngeal motility and they end up with reactive airway disease over the long term, four or five years of age and they're, they've got reactive airway disease and they're on inhalers. And, and really the reason that they have the reactive airway disease is because they're refluxing and, and they don't control the refluxate very well in the back of the mouth and they end up with an aspiration of their. And then you have the classic adolescent teenage uh, findings. Now, you, the, the esophagitis, I don't take it wrong, they don't see it in babies. Babies arch, and they see those kind of posturing symptoms in babies, but they don't come right out and tell us that they have retrosternal chest pain or they have you know, pain that's associated with their esophagitis. Um, the, the teenagers can also develop strictures, pretty rare nowadays, but it can happen. And even Barrett's esophagitis, which is pre-cancer, that occurs uh, in the lower esophageal mucosa. So we do know that the pathology of GERD is related to esophageal injury. Um, it's usually related to the acid that's associated with, although we do have some evidence now that we can have bile uh, injury as well. So children that have been on proton pump inhibitors or 
acid suppression uh, can also have uh, changes within their stomach as well as their lower esophagus. And the extent of the injury that's caused by the gastroesophageal reflux disease is really related to how susceptible the mucosa is to the injury, how long is the, is the acid there or whatever offending uh, fluid is there, and then how much volume is, is present. So um, if you look at how we do pH studies, I don't think any gastroenterologists are here or not, but you know, one of the things that they look at in pH studies is the number of reflux events that occur during a period of time, but also the amount of time that the pH falls below a certain level within the esophagus. So these are all the things that lead us to the, 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 the events that lead to esophageal injury. Now, not a lot of babies that we operate on, we are operating on for other reasons than esophageal injury. It's usually related to failure to thrive, the acute life-threatening events, and, and reactive airway disease or, or pulmonary symptoms. So this is really more the esophagitis pre barracks phase that we're talking about with regard to esophageal injury. And these are what we normally as surgeons and, and providers uh, think about with regard to the barriers of, of um, mucosal injury. Uh, the lower esophageal sphincter, which is this kind of structure right here, um, it's a high pressure zone at the lower part of the esophagus that separates the esophagus from, from the uh, stomach. And normally that, that lower esophageal sphincter is tightened up and it relaxes with a swallow. So we, we initiate a swallow and we go through certain waves of peristalsis down the esophagus and then the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes as the bolus of food goes into the stomach. Um, there's also um, something called intraesophageal uh, uh, pressure. And that is something that just occurs because of pressure from the outside, either from the abdomen or the thorax. We don't really think about that so much in kids. We do think about the angle of hiss quite a bit. This is the angle of hiss right here. And the more blunt that angle is, the more uh, susceptible you are to reflux. And normally we like to see this angle be real cute when the stomach comes up like that. And then as the stomach fills up, it kind of pitches off the lower esophageal uh, uh, region or the lower sphincter. So this is something we really worry about when we do gastrostomies. Is we put a gastrostomy in and <clears throat> say the gastrostomy goes over here and you pull down the stomach to bring the, the gastrostomy up to uh, the anterior abdominal wall and you blunt that angle of hiss. And so when people talk about post-gastrostomy reflux disease, that's why it happens. You have a child that has, you know, let's say has mild uh, reflux disease and you do a gastrostomy and then they get terrible reflux. You almost certainly put the gastrostomy in the wrong spot or they were just so predisposed to just any movement of the stomach and flattening out that angle of hiss is what's causing one of the huge advantages to a laparoscopic gastrostomy over a peg, by the way, because when we do a laparoscopic gastrostomy, we look at the stomach, we pick the exact spot we want to put it in the stomach, paying attention to two things. Number one, we're not going to try and flatten out that angle of hiss. And number two, we're going to put the gastrostomy in a place that if we have to come back and do a fundal plication, we can do it without taking the gastrostomy down. Whereas if you get a peg, the peg is a scope in, in the mouth, down in the stomach, and then you just pick a spot that looks good in the gastric wall, you put a needle in through the, through the abdomen and, and put the button right there. So you don't have any understanding of where, the, where you're putting it in relation to both, like I said, where the angle of hiss is going to be affected and where you may have to go back later and do a fundal plication. And then finally, various mucosal injury is esophageal motility. So if the esophagus doesn't work great and stuff gets up into the esophagus and, and it doesn't contract and push it back down again, you're going to have, you're going to have susceptibility to mucosal injury. Almost never see this in infants. So this is, this is um, something that happens in adults. Um, we don't even do motility studies in kids uh, because I've never, there's been several studies to look at motility studies in children and show that there's no benefit to it. So um, there is one caveat to that. So the adolescent teenager who gets achalasia, where you have spasm in the lower esophageal sphincter, those patients will get motility studies. We don't use motility studies as a mechanism by which we're gonna decide if we do an operation. Whereas in the adult population, they all get motility studies because if their motility is bad, they do a different operation. So, uh, we kind of talked about the lower esophageal sphincter. It's probably the most important thing that we have in children, or children have to prevent reflux disease. Um, like I, I kind of talked about these things. I'm really going to point this third point out. So the lower esophageal sphincter is it's in its location. It's supposed to be, and it's held there by a, a little layer of, of tissue called the phrenoesophageal membrane. And that Phrenoesophageal membrane you'll see is something that we as pediatric surgeons have finally figured out is very, very important for our population of patients. And we'll talk about that a little bit, okay? Um, this is based, this, this um, bullet point right here is based on the adult literature. And it's, I put it in here because we're gonna talk about <coughs> what operation we did to help this. So when we're trying to prevent reflux disease, the adult literature suggested that you need to have a certain length and a certain pressure of lower esophageal sphincter 
in order to prevent reflux disease. And so they created an operation that did that. It, it increased this lower esophageal sphincter length and hopefully increased the pressure. And what we did as pediatric surgeons is, oh, we had this great operation that, we're doing, that was doing so well in the adults. So we translated that operation into children. Just de novo. We just, just like if we were to do a laparoscopic appendectomy, we took it from the adults and, and, and started doing the kids. And that is where 15, 20 years ago, the operations, the, even when we started doing open fundos, so this is probably way before lots of people in this room, but we translated from the open even to the laparoscopic era where we started doing the same operation laparoscopically. And we're going to talk about why that was a bad operation. Normally, it relaxes. Um, we get something called transient LES uh, relaxation, which I'm going to show you a graph of in a couple of slides, which is probably the number one reason why children reflux is because of these transient lower esophageal relaxations, um, which is what they call the TLACRs right here. So this is what we were talking about with the adults, okay? So this publication, Tom Meester is probably the most famous anti-reflux surgeon in the world. He's now retired, you can see the date of this publication. So he, this is telling you where we took our data uh, and techniques from, from 79 and applied it to children. And so the old gray hair people in the surgery room, which was probably just Dave and me, honestly, um, did open operations. And, and, and this, is, this is what we did it from. Craig might fall into that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, so what Tom said is you had to have more than three centimeters of lower esophageal sphincter total length. Of that, um, had to, uh, two centimeters had to be in the abdomen. And if you didn't, this is what happened. If you had more than three centimeters, you had 100% competency of lower esophageal sphincter. And they did monometry studies on adults to prove this, something that we would never do with kids. If you have less than three, but more than one, 64% of the time, the lower esophageal sphincter is competent. And if you had less than one centimeter, only 20% was a competent. So, this statement right here was what was the main thing that came out of this publication is you have to mobilize the esophagus to get it down into the abdomen to create this length of lower esophageal sphincter in order to prevent reflux. So that's what we started doing. Um, we'll come back to that. So just a, a, a few notes about why kids are different than adults too. Number one, an adults get reflux disease because they get hiatal hernias. So the hiatal hernia occurs the, the hiatus where the esophagus comes through, and you'll see pictures of this, where the esophagus comes through into the abdomen, becomes stretched out, and the stomach goes up into the abdomen, and then that lower esophageal sphincter and all those barriers we talked about go away. <clears throat> children don't, or children rarely have hiatal hernias. They have de novo reflux because of an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter, almost always. Um, it's a different operation when we have a child that has hiatal hernia. But that's, that's where the one problem was for us when we decided to do operations the way the adults did is we were translating what their pathology was into kids and it wasn't the same pathology because kids don't get high hernias. This is what they do, you know, they, they reflux, usually that, that uh, lower esophageal sphincter will get stronger and better by about three months of age, 70% of patients that have reflux will be better. Um, only 5% will reflux in one year. It's usually around eight months where you really start to see improvement and this is because this is when you start transitioning them off formula or breast milk onto cereals, and, and that really helps the reflux disease, the reflux uh, component. By 18 months, it's almost all gone. And in two years, um, we say that the reflux symptoms, it becomes subjective. So you know, you know, how's the patient doing? How are they feeling? It's no longer this objective sense that they're not gaining weight, they've got reflux disease, and they're having aspiration pneumonias, failure to thrive, um, or those all these spells. Um, so now we're like, oh, we're not feeling good. You know, he's got his head, head problems with cavities, bad dentition. The, you know, it's the reflux symptoms that are more subjective that we don't pick up on as easily. So here's a graph <clears throat> that shows what happens when we swallow. So uh, lower esophageal relaxation uh, is, is not specifically related to the swallowing mechanism up here, but it is related to what happens with maybe if, some, if there's a gastroenterologist in here. If correctly, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to have them go through this slide that's better. But so it is what it is related to what happens as the esophagus contracts. Okay, so we initiate a swallow, and then the esophagus takes over, and then there's contractility in the esophagus that pushes the food bolus down. And so you can see when you look at this timeline right here, all these pressure lines are not moving, right? So there's just constant pressure. But then when you look at the lower esophageal sphincter right here, you get this big dip. And it's a transient relaxation with the lower esophageal sphincter. For some reason, with nothing happening inside the esophagus, the low pressure speaks or, uh, spikes or decreases there, just relaxes. It opens up and then you get a reflux that comes up. So this is thought to be the main reason of why 
children reflux. And this is an old publication, but there hasn't been anything published that uh, really, uh, that really counters this finding back 30 years ago. Uh, this is just a great picture I put in there to show you what you know, a bad angle of his looks like. So the, the flatter this is, you can see where there'd be more likelihood. This is a contrast, by the way, when it's gone back up into the esophagus. So they've swallowed it. There's air in it. They, they usually have some, uh, something that creates air <clears throat> that will help delineate what's going on in the esophagus. And so the contrast has come down. It's in a stomach that's flattened out, and it goes back up. And I talked about the importance of this situation with gastrostomy already. So how do they present? Um, this is probably not rocket science to anybody in the room that takes care of kids that have had reflux disease. But infants, they're dry and they're fussy. They arch their back. Uh, they can, if they're really, really severe, they can get food aversion. Um, that leads to you know, poor, poor oral intake because of the reflux and the food aversion leads to the malnutrition or failure to thrive. Uh, the one to five-year-olds usually have feeding aversion of certain types of foods. Uh, and they'll have more vague symptoms. It's a child who complains of abdominal pain, and they don't really reference the abdominal pain. It's actually retrosternal. Um, it's anybody's infant or child, they have home that says their belly hurts, and they wear the belly hurt, and they go like this, and you have seen that, and appendicitis is where the belly hurt, and they put it right there. It's no longer vague symptoms. The one to five year old is the, is the population that really struggles with giving you specific findings that they can actually translate to you. It makes sense. And then once they get in past that adolescent and into the teenage years, then they can really start to describe what any one of us in here, if we have reflux disease, would say what we have. It's the ep epigastric retrosternal burning pain, bad taste in the back of the mouth. And the adolescents get treated pretty, you know, it's not uncommon for us to see. We don't do a lot of fundal applications in adolescents, fortunately. But in my experience, when I do do a fundal application in an adolescent, that, that person's probably been treated for several years. And they're coming because they've had a complication. Maybe they developed a stricture or they've got bad esophagitis and somebody's done an endoscopy. Or if heaven forbid, they got Barrett's. Um, and that's, you know, that's a preventable complication of reflux disease, which is a precancer stage for esophageal carcinoma. So we, don't, we hate to see Barrett's in this population because we, we can't reverse the Barrett's. All we can do is stop the reflux and we hope that the Barrett's will get better by itself. So this, this group is something as pediatric surgeons, first, it's, it's a different operation entirely. It's much more difficult to do this operation than it is to do this operation. But oftentimes you're doing an operation to prevent a complication that's already in place. And it's, that's, I guess, like the strictures or, or the mucosal changes. So what do we want to do as, as treating GERD, okay? This is, this is medical or surgical, so this is not us just as surgeons what we want to do. This is any patient that comes in that has gastroesophageal reflexes. We want to relieve the symptoms. We want to, if they have mucosal injury, we want to do something to get that mucosal injury healed. And then we want to prevent the complications. And this is, this is the problem with, if you have these complications and you're treating it medically and they don't get better, then that's where you have to start thinking we should be doing something besides proton pump inhibitors or, or other forms of acid suppression. Because medical therapy oftentimes will not prevent the pneumonias because it's a reflux problem and then it gets down into the lungs, right? You can change the acid composition, but, but if it doesn't mean that that's going to prevent injury in the lungs. It's not just the acid that does that. The ALTI spells, we don't even understand why children have ALTI spells. If it's a vasovagal thing that happens when they get refluxate up into the esophagus, it leads to, leads to the ALTI spell. So oftentimes, kids that are on reflux, anti-reflux medications that have ALTIs will still have an ALTI spell. And so my rule of thumb, if somebody, if I, if I have a consult about a patient has reflux, is they get two ALTI spells, and that's it. After that, they they get a fundal plantation. Because the third one might not just be an ALTI spell. It's that bad of a vasovagal response, but they're turning cyanotic and becoming apnea. And the stricture one, you might be able to prevent that. The stricture, I think most of us feel like stricture is almost completely acid-driven. So if you can stop the acid production and, and stop the mucosal injury related to the acid production, you can probably stop the stricture. So from a medical management, I put H2 antagonists up here. I'm not sure how many of us really use H2 antagonists. We certainly don't on the surgical side. I think if they're coming to see us and they haven't had a medical uh, course of treatment for the reflux disease, most of us would just go straight to a proton pump inhibitor. I think a lot of pediatricians for babies especially will use um, an H2 blocker still, which is totally appropriate. I don't think there's a problem with that. We certainly see H2 blockers used in the hospital all the time and TPN and things like that, whether or not they should be or shouldn't be. We could have a separate conversation about. 
Um, we do know that it reduces asset production, um, but we also know that it's not, it doesn't reduce asset production to the point where it's gonna reverse the effects of the mucosal injury if it's already there. It's just, it's just not that effective. So that's when proton pump inhibitors come in, right? So there's a whole host of different proton pump inhibitors now. They completely eliminate the acid production. They just shut off the proton pump. So there's no acid production. Assuming that there's not some other pathologic reason for the, for the patient to be creating acid, they'll, they'll, they'll stop acid production entirely. So if you look at the pH of the stomach after somebody that's on a proton pump inhibitor, it'll one off you, but what will go for? Whereas H2 blockers, oftentimes, they'll still have pHs that are in that four to five range. And this is a whole group of, of drugs that uh, was really popular for reflux disease about 10 years ago. Um, and the whole thought was, well, if they could empty their stomach better, then they would have less reflux disease, which is true, right? If, if, you, can get the, if you can get the food to leave the stomach and not go up the esophagus, then they'll have less reflux disease. But really what's happening is you're trying to get the, the, the food to take the path of least resistance. And in most circumstances, if you have an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter, you still have a pylorus. Even if you can want to squeeze the stomach in any way, shape, or form you can to get the stomach to try and empty, the pylorus still has to relax. And if the lower esophageal sphincter is already open, you're going to tend to still have reflux because it's just going to go up the path of least resistance. Um, Erythromycin is a drug I think we use uh, pretty regularly for patients that do have delayed gastric emptying. It does seem to help. But in general, we're, I'm going to talk about another slide about delayed gastric emptying. In general, promotility agents aren't great for preventing the complications of reflux disease. So this is a kind of typical surgeon. If somebody came into my office and, and, and I was asked to see them in consultation for refluxes, this is kind of a typical surgical approach. So we'd say you have to be treated for at least six weeks. Uh, before you really need to see me, unless there's, unless there's complications that we talked about, you know, all these spells and things like that. But just straightforward, symptomatic gastroesophageal reflux disease. If they have any kind of response, they should be treated for at least three months to see if they can avoid an operation. If there's no response after six weeks, they're still having complications, or after three months, their symptoms are completely improved, then they should be considered for a reflux, anti-reflux operation. Doesn't mean when we see them, we're not gonna say, your symptoms aren't bad enough, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have a frontal plication. It's just that we would like to see them, I would like to see them at this stage and not when they're 15 and they have their stricture. Uh, and now I'm preventing reflux but not to do with the stricture or some other source of complication that's in the esophagus that we can't fix that. We just try to prevent it from getting worse. And so fair indications for frontal plication, I kind of hit all these pretty heavily, I think. Um, certainly for the surgical resonance in the room, um, these are the three big ones. You know, the, the failure to thrive, the ALPs, and the refractory pulmonary symptoms. Okay, so what workup do we want to do before we, we just want to go and do an operation, right? What workup is beneficial for us to, to um, have as, as uh, an aid in our diagnostic armamentarium before we just commit this child to an operation? Every child needs an upper GI, uh, and that is because there's a reasons, there are reasons for reflux disease that are anatomic. Okay, so we're looking at an upper GI, we want to see what the stomach looks like. We want to see if they have malrotation, uh, because if they have malrotation, number one, we have to deal with it when we're there, but also, number two, they may not need an anti-reflux operation if they have malrotation. By just addressing the malrotation of the lad's bands may be enough for their reflux to go away. If they have a hiatal hernia, it's a totally different operation. We want to be able to tell the families that ahead of time. Your complication related to this operation just went up tenfold because your child has a hiatal hernia versus just a de novo refluxer. If you have a duodenal web, that's a totally different operation. You wouldn't want to wrap a child that has a duodenal web and not emptying their stomach and not just create a closed loop obstruction. So every child, 100% of children, need a, fundal, need a, need a gas, uh, uh, upper GI before we do an operation. Uh, pH studies and impedance studies. So, um, for a long time, pH studies and impedance studies are kind of cons considered the gold standard. And I'm going to give you some data about they are really, really good, but they're not great at helping us tell, define which patients should get an operation. And I'll come back to that. But I would say, in general, these two things certainly in the adolescent population absolutely are beneficial. In an infant population, I'm not sure that you have to do it in every infant because there's two things that exist. Number one, we don't have great norms for infants, so we don't know 
what their pH you know, level should be, because all the pH impedance data that I'm aware of is based upon older, older people. And number two, we're still dealing with, you know, the ability of children to reflux through chalasia versus reflux through pathologic reflux and not understanding which one is which. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that. Uh, endoscopy is great, but it's only what you see. So if you see a stricture, you see an ulcer, yeah, the kid's got reflux. But if you don't see anything, which you don't usually see in kids, it's not very beneficial. However, if you do endoscopy with biopsy and you show inflammation in the mucosa or Barrett's, this is probably the most sensitive indication for, to do an operation. Because now you know you've got ongoing mucosal irritation inflammation that's not being treated by, by the, um, the, the medical treatment. Gastric emptying study. This was a big thing, again, back uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we would see patients that they all had late gastric emptying. And so the, the classic operation was a fundal plication of the pyloroplasty. So we'd, do, we'd wrap the stomach and we'd divide the pylor so that the stomach emptied better. Uh, I can't, I don't know how many, how many of those I've, I've done. It was just a bad operation and we didn't understand why. And the reason is, is because when you, when you wrap them, their gastric emptying gets way better. Right? There's a few studies that I'll talk, I'll talk about here. And then <coughs> the motility studies, like I said, children have great motility, with the exception of tracheosophageal fistula. Um, that's the one, one um, caveat, which we're not gonna, I'm not going to touch on fungal application and tracheosophageal fistula at all, because you could probably write probably a whole talk about what we should do about reflux disease and tracheosophageal fistula. The bottom line is no single test is 100% accurate. Um, endoscopy, which people thought was the best, is probably the least sensitive because in kids we just don't see the mucosal irritation and the injury like we do in adults. But the biopsy is, is still the most sensitive. And pH studies are very, very sensitive. So we still do tend to get a lot of pH studies. And that's not a bad thing. Um, here's the study I wanted to talk to you about. This is a, a paper we looked at in 2012 trying to figure out if pH studies and impedance studies made a difference. So these are all infants less than six months of age, okay? There were 24 infants that got a fund, uh, the 33 infants that got a uh, fundal plication and 24 that didn't. And I just call attention to what their pH and impedance studies showed. So you know, they both had abnormal pH probes. They both had high uh, uh, impedance reflux events, although the non-operative actually had more than the operative, interestingly. Um, they all had acid reflux. Um, they all had some percent of non-acid reflux, and the MII Pro was abnormal in 100% of patients in both arms. So you look at that and you say, how can I possibly use that to decide which, and by the way, did this population, there was no difference in medication usage at six months after the study or after the operation. So you look at that and you say, how can this study in any way, shape, or form help me make a decision whether to do an operation when you have all this conflicting information in there? And so what we took away from this is that it's probably okay to do it if you really need, if you're really questioning whether or not the child is refluxing, it's probably okay to do the pH and the study, but you probably shouldn't decide if you're gonna do an operation. There was something that drove these 33 patients to get an operation. And we went back and looked at the data, it was, it was a host of different events, primarily failure to thrive, all D events and aspiration pneumonia. So if, you're, if your patient is having complications related to reflux disease, it's probably not as important what the pH or impedance studies shows as what it is what they're doing clinically. And remember, these are all Mickey babies. These are all less than six months of age. So we, we moved away from pH and impedance studies in this population because of this study. Rather than putting them through that, just looking at the patient, talking to the family, talking to the nurses, talking to the neonatologist, what is this patient doing for you on a day-to-day -day basis that's making it so difficult for you to manage it? And if they're having that much problem, not keeping food down, heaven forbid going to a gastrojejunostomy or a nasojejunostomy feeding tube that gets pulled out and has to be repositioned you know, every week, that's when we started to talk about fundal plication as a mechanism to stop their reflux disease. So gastric emptying. So these are three great studies, all of which show the exact same thing. Children that had delayed gastric emptying on an upper GI, um, and, needed an, and needed a fundal application because they had reflux disease. All three of these studies showed that if you do the uh, anti-reflux operation, the gastric emptying improves. And it goes back to what I said before. If you have a path of least resistance between two ways, one is up and one is out, and the up is always going to be easier than the out, if you stop the ability of stuff to go up in the esophagus, the vast majority of children, their gastric emptying is actually normal. 
it's just squeezing, the stomach's just there squeezing, 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 it's just pushing it up the esophagus. So you stop the reflux up the esophagus and it actually empties the way it's supposed to. So we virtually, I don't remember last time I did a, a pyroplasty with a, with a fundal plantation. Um, it's just not something we do anymore. But you know, again, back to the gray hair people, we did a lot of them when we were, were training and probably young, young in our careers. So what type of fundal application should we do? So there's several different types. Um, I don't think this one's a type anymore. I don't think any child should get an open fundal application. Dan may disagree with me if he has a single ventricle kid and doesn't want to have a new perineum put in there and blow it up. That, that's something we could argue about at a different time. But, but by and large, uh, you know, laparoscopic fundal application is the gold standard. There's different ways you can do it. You can do a Nissen, which is this operation right here. You take the stomach and you wrap it around the esophagus. Or you can do a partial esophagus uh, fundal application, which has numerous names and numerous switching different ways to do it. Um, this is a posterior partial uh, fundal application. You can do an anterior partial fundal application where you just take this part of the stomach and you bring it over the top and not all the way down. Um, interestingly, as far as I'm aware, uh, there's no difference in long-term outcome between these two, uh, these multiple different operations. Um, maybe some higher rates of retching uh, or not retching, dysphagia in this operation. Although with the technique that I'm gonna show you, it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, the advantages of laparoscopy, this is kind of an older slide, but it really kind of speaks to the obvious. We don't do open fundal applications anymore. Certainly it doesn't hurt as much. Patients that have a lap fundal probably get three doses of Tylenol or something like that. There's real time 2.5 to 5 millimeter incisions. Hospitalization, they're going usually home the next day, uh, within 24 to 36 hours. They're back to normal activity for a baby, you know, two days for a child. I let them go back to normal activity within two weeks. And certainly cosmesis, you don't have this big transverse vertical scar. You've got these little poke holes like barely visible by, by six months of follow-up. Um, dysphagia, uh, it doesn't happen in babies because it's just fluid, right? It's just breast milk or formula. So you virtually never see dysphagia in a baby, but you can see it in the older populations that are on softer diet. This is one of the big things that people were super critical about when we were doing the old operation as you have high, these really high dysphagia rates and retching. And so anybody in here that had a baby that got a fundal application are retched all the time. Um, this is what we were trying to prevent. Assuming that the, dis, the retching was related to the fact that the wrap was too tight and causing dysphagia. So if I have a child that's, you know, set five years old and eating solids, I usually will tell the parents to keep them, you know, on some sort of softer foods for at least the first two to three weeks. If you're an adult and you get a fundal application, I don't know what the current recommendation is, I know what a period of time it was like six weeks where you didn't do any kind of pureed foods. And the dysphagia rates in adults are 25%. Um, so one quarter of adults that get fundal applications will have some sort of obstruction. So in soft diet, uh, like I said, more important in older patients. And then this is something that the parents uh, really need to be made aware of if their child is going off to you know, school and they're six years old and they're you know, taking big bites because if they do have tightness at the wrap and they take a big bite or they eat a hot dog or something and get stuck at the wrap, you gotta go in and take it out. You can't just push it through because in fact got a brand new bundle there. I think the bougie has prevented this problem, but I think that is, is anecdotal and probably related to individual surgeons because I, I know several surgeons who don't use a bougie when they do that wrap, or I showed you when you wrap the stomach around. Um, I use a bougie for every patient because it just makes me feel better knowing that I'm calibrating the esophagus where I want it to be and I can't make that wrap too tight to make it uh, cause obstruction. I don't know what other people in the room do, but like I said, some people do and some people don't. Personally, I think it helps. Uh, failure rate. So this is where we, what we were talking about before. This is a huge failure rate. 30% failure rates for missing fundal application in neurologically abnormal children. This is a, this is a pediatric... Uh, publication from about 25 years ago, I guess now. Um, so there's no doubt that doing this operation at that time was not a great operation. I don't know that any of us in this room would do surgery. Any type of surgery in the room would offer very many patients an operation telling them that there was going to be a 30% failure rate. Most of us would look back and that say, no, that's not an acceptable failure rate for what I'm going to do and try and make it better, which is what we ultimately did. Even a 6% failure rate is pretty high. For a neurologically normal, we're going to tell them 6% time they are going to have to come back and do another operation. So I just want to show a few pictures of what we do. This is me doing an operation. Everybody's a little bit different, but I think the setup by and large is 
is pretty close. Um, so I put a five millimeter camera in the belly button and then there's um, four instruments that go around the abdomen uh, that we use to both retract the liver and mobilize the stomach and do the rack. Okay? And these instruments are three or five millimeters. And I, I just use a stab incision. I think all, the, all of our partners use stab incision in one shape or another. And then maybe use some other cannulas in here if they have to go in and out, in and out, in and out. Um, oh, this is, I forgot I left this in here, sorry. Um, this was just something about stab incisions. We looked at the, that stab incision technique and to see how we could do it, how, how we were doing and how many times we were using it and what that meant. So this is all the procedures we use stab incisions on over a period of time. And the number of uh, cannulas that we use, that's that little white cannula, this one right here. Number of cannulas, because they're expensive, right? I don't, I don't know how much a cannula costs now, but that cannula is probably $40 or $50. Um, and then how many we saved? So we used 511, we saved 1300. And then this is the institutional saving for the, our hospital for that time frame. So I forgot I left in there. I should take it out. <laughs> so now you guys got your financial uh, financial update for the day. And then the adolescent, uh, still the same thing. This is uh, when we're using a robot. That's a, this is a robot arm right here. Um, if, it's, if it's a skinny adolescent, you can still do a stab incision even with a five millimeter instrument. Otherwise, we, we would convert these to all five millimeter cables here. And this is what we're trying to prevent. This is the number one thing that, that, um, that kills us and, and harms patients. This is a, a slip missing. So here's the diaphragm right here, okay? Let's see the diaphragm in the lateral there. And this is the stomach that has gone up through the esophagus. And that child is gonna have reflux and retch and be miserable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is also an older um, uh, slide and they're old because this doesn't happen anymore. Uh, so that's why we're stuck looking at old slides. But this is the failure rate <coughs> for fundal plication. And you can see this in this study, it was a 31% failure rate, terrible, unacceptable. And reherniation was, was half of those parasophageal hernias, which is a, fo is a form of uh, herniation. Uh, where part of the stomach goes up, not all the stomach goes up, was 16%. Uh, Poor rap instruction, not very often, but that's less and less all the time because we understand more about it. And then other reasons. So 31%. Uh, so we, in Kansas City, we, I was a fellow and a junior faculty member, so this is a pretty old slide, but what happened is we started looking at why we were having all these failures. And we said, well, if it's re we're really having all these rap herniations, maybe we should put stitches around the esophagus and sew the esophagus to the diaphragm and prevent the, prevent the, uh, the wrap from going up into the abdomen, or up into the chest. So we did that. And this is actually Whit Holcomb, one of my partners. And this is a retrospective study. Um, we went back and looked at, hey, I started doing these stitches. And I think my wrap herniation rates are lower. So it's, it's a little messy. It is, it is what it is. And so he put in stitches at 8, 11, 1, and 4. And then this is the posterior stitch of the approximate security. So you can see here and here, there and there. And he showed a herniation, a decrease in his herniation rate from 12% to 5%, which did not reach statistical significance, but certainly clinically that would be a relevant decrease in, in failure rates. So at that point, um, it was a visiting professor and me and uh, uh, Gabby and Michonne St. Peter and Whitholt and we were sitting in the operating room and we were doing this operation and the visiting professor was talking about how we need to mobilize the esophagus like the Meester told us to do. And we started talking about, was that the right thing? Should we really be doing it? And, and he said, well, one of his partners was actually not doing it anymore. He wasn't doing this maximum mobilization, bringing all the esophagus down. So it, it appeared about two hours in that operating room, we decided that we we're gonna do a trial. And the trial was gonna be based upon doing the old fashioned operation where you mobilize the esophagus and brought everything down the abdomen, did the wrap, getting that length of esophagus the way it was, and then not doing that. Leaving, remember we talked about the frontal esophageal membrane, the most important con contributor to the angle of his, leaving that frontal esophageal membrane in place and doing the wrap. And so we called it the, the maximum mobilization and the minimum mobilization. So this is a maximum mobilization. This is the esophagus. You can see this is the opening to the diaphragm. There's, oh, there's space between that going up into the mediastinum. And this is a minimum mobilization. This is a posterior window that's here, but all those attachments are left in place. And this is just a quick video showing what, what we do. And it's not a hard operation <clears throat> to do this. In fact, it's kind of fun to do this. 
except when you look back and say, well, you just destroyed this child's ability to stop reflux disease. Um, any innate ability they have to stop reflux disease, you destroyed it, and you're creating this huge window that's going to have the consequence of this stomach ultimately going back up into the chest because they don't have the, the ability to prevent that from happening anymore. Even though you close it back up again, all the, all the native membranes are all gone now. So we create a little window back there, and that's where the stomach comes around. And you see, we'll, we'll take down this whole frontal esophageal membrane, which now we leave intact. We don't really even touch it. You do have to get enough esophagus down to wrap. So, so we don't, you can't wrap the stomach around itself because you won't do anything. You gotta wrap the stomach around the esophagus. So we do have to mobilize it enough to get down to do the wrap. But we don't have to necessarily mobilize it as much. Well, we shouldn't give away the story before it's done. We were thinking we didn't need to mobilize it as much as we were doing at this point. This is a lot of mobilization. It's all esophagus hiatus. And you can see what we're doing the hiatus, the, the opening between the chest and the abdomen, pulling that down. You guys remember doing that operation? <laughs> Okay, so what we did is we randomized uh, kids to either get a maximum mobilization or a minimum mobilization, okay? They all had to get the esophageal curl stitches because that's what we were doing. <clears throat> and we were basing our sample size based upon the recurrence rates that we had in, in the uh, retrospective review. So we could not do the, the, the esophageal curl stitches. Uh, we stratified for neurologic impairment because we all know that neurologically impaired kids do worse than, than neurologically normal kids. So we couldn't have a population that had more neurologically impaired kids in them and, and one that didn't and compared those two outcomes. So when children got randomized, if they were neurologically impaired, they got randomized to a certain arm, and if they were not, they got randomized to a certain arm. And then both arms with inside those two, those two stratifications. We took pictures of every operation, and this is a, 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 a randomized control trial that was done with us in, in Alabama. We sent our pictures to Alabama, they sent their pictures to us, blinded, which one was min and max, and we had to, they had to look at them and say this is a min max, Min mobilization or max. Interesting, there was a hundred percent correlation in those pictures. Not surprising given what you saw with how much mobilization was used in the softness. All patients underwent an uh, upper uh, gastrointestinal contrast study in one year to look for hiatal hernia rates, and hiatal hernia rates was the was the up primary outcome variable. So if they had a hiatal hernia rate at one year, then they failed their, their, um, their operation. And so we enrolled 177 patients in two years, and then we had our first uh, data safety monitoring board that we found out that. We were doing a bad operation. I'm going to skip this for purposes of time. Um, so this is what we found at that first DSMB. So we had 87 patients in the max group and 90 patients in the min group. You can see that the randomization sequence worked because there's no different in ages, weights, gender, or neural impairment. So these are these are two perfectly good cohorts in the min and the max groups. This is what we found with regard to outcome. So rat variation rate in the mass group, 30%, which is what we've seen historically in the, those other studies. In the men group, it was 7.8%, so still not great. What we're gonna see, and I'm gonna talk about another study in a few minutes, is this number's actually gone down, but obviously that's highly statistically significant. And then reoperation, not everybody that has a herniation, by the way, needs, needs reoperation. So lots of kids, they'll have a small herniation and they're not symptomatic at all. We'll just leave those alone and watch them. So reoperation, over half of these got reoperation, less than half of those got reoperation. Interestingly, there is no difference in rap herniation rates between neural impaired and neurologically normal children. So what we were finding, in, when we look back retrospectively, is that a child that's neurologically impaired and wretches gets an upper GI to look for a rap herniation, right? And so there's no correlation between that rap herniation and necessarily the retching. That the retching can also be a central, central thing and not just rap herniation. Neurologically impaired children aren't retching, I'm sorry, neurologically normal children aren't retching, so they don't get upper GIs. So when we started doing upper GIs on every patient, we found that the, the RAP herniation rate in neurologically impaired and neurologically normal children were actually the same. The retching wasn't the same, but the herniation rates, the complication of the operation that we were offering people was exactly the same in both groups. So at 6.5 years follow-up, there's 75% of the patients in the max group were able to be followed up with 72 in the group. There were three patients that needed dilation, all of them in the max group. There wasn't a single patient in the min dissection group that ever needed the dilation. And that's because we assume we take everything apart and we put it back together after, we, after we've mobilized the esophagus down into the abdomen. And when we put it back together, we put it, put it back together bad. And so we change the angle of the esophagus. We do something, make it too tight. And so those patients develop dysphagia. If we never touch that, we leave it alone and just do the fundoplication. Don't touch the hiatus. 
then they do fine because that's their normal swallowing mechanism. Um, oops, sorry. The herniation rates at this 6.5 follow up, this is not operative rates, these are patients that have herniation. 36.5% in the max group and 12 in the median. And you can see that the max group, the herniation rates occurred almost half, twice as quickly, if that's right when you say it, at 14 months versus 30 months. So, not surprising that a maximum dissection is a bad thing. We shouldn't be doing it, okay? Um, we didn't know, though, what was the deal with the esophageal curl sutures. Did we need to do those at all? So the next logical step is we have to do another trial and randomize to doing no dissection and either plus or minus the esophageal curl stitches to see really what was the best operation. And this, this, this study is, is fascinating. This study hasn't been published yet, so this is the stuff I was waiting for last night from Kansas City. So if you guys would mind not sharing this, because it's going to be presented at our annual meeting in the morning. Um, they were kind enough to get it to me last night. So what we did is we randomized uh, to stitches or no stitches. We didn't have to stratify it to neurological impairment because we know now that the, that the wrap herniation rates are the same from the previous study. We know that wrap herniation rates are the same in neurologically impaired children and neurologically normal children, i.e. we just saved ourselves 170 patients to have to enroll to answer the question because if you stratify the different groups, your, your sample size goes up. Uh, we still took pictures of uh, software curl junction to make sure that we weren't doing too much of a dissection. I think this is the home run. We got to the point where we just weren't touching the, soft, the feral esophageal membrane at all. All patients still underwent that upper intestinal gastrointestinal gastro, gastro contrast study a year. And we enrolled 121 patients between 2010 and 2014. I left Kansas City in 2012. That's why I didn't have this data. There were 14 patients that were excluded. One died. Uh, sorry, one had a hiatal hernia and 13 died. So it was a pretty fragile population. Um, they were excluded equally between the two groups. Uh, and you can see that because the sample size is, is the same in both groups. So there are 53 that were able to be uh, evaluated in the, in the stitch group and 50, sorry, 54, that's wrong, 54 and 53. It took 20 minutes longer to do the operation in the stitch group, not surprising because it takes longer to place those four stitches and you don't have to do anything with them. Uh, you just save that 20 minutes, so that's basically 20 minutes you're saving. And we were able to get contrast studies um, about a, a third in each arm. Not a single wrap herniation in either arm. And this is, this is 120 patients that we're done. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we got less and less and less and less aggressive about touching the ferrosophageal membrane at all. So a follow-up at four years was either a clinic or a phone call. There, again, there was no evidence of wrap herniation. We didn't we did that upper intestinal contrast study in one year. These patients didn't get repeat upper gastrointestinal contrast studies. This was based upon the fact that they developed symptoms or had another operation. There was one reoperation in the, in the no stitch group for a loose wrap. So they developed reflux symptoms because the wrap just wasn't tighter and it came apart. And there was no difference in reflux symptoms or medications between the two groups. So it's very clear that the operation we were doing 20 years ago up until 2007 or eight was a terrible operation we should, we should not have been doing. It. But the operation we can provide now is a very, very good operation. If you look at the consequences between having a child with a gastrojagen ostomy tube or even a nasal duodenal tube, and, a long, and that's gonna be a long-term problem for that child versus having an operation that can completely stop their reflux and go home in a day and not have to ever worry about having, having to have those tubes replaced repetitive times or the otitis media or the feeding aversion or anything else that goes along with that, it seriously needs to be thinking about the surgery as, as an um, option. So in, in summary, um, uh, that's, we talked about the status, it is interesting. It's been markedly reduced. The one complication that we worry about is their app herniation. We know that the long-term functional results, um, as well as the medication and symptoms results are exactly the same uh, as what they were. Actually, the functional results are better because we haven't had a single patient need a dilation, whereas before there were multiple patients that had that be dilated because of uh, making the wrap or the esophageal hiatus too tight. And we also just stress the, the, the benefits of my philosophy. Um, yeah, we have time to show this. So this is how we, uh, this is kind of how we do. We all do it a little bit different, but we all kind of do it the same. I just show this because it's how we do gastrostomy buttons. And I know I'm talking about reflux disease, but gastrostomy is important reflux disease. So when we go in, we can actually pick exactly where we want the stomach to be. Um, and then we put stitches either like being shown here, transabdominal wall, or some people will actually make the decision to bring the stomach up and sew it to the posterior aspect of the abdominal wall. But the key is we have control of where we're doing the button. It's not being just placed any place in the stomach. 
So what I did, I put stitches on either side. This is a technique called the Jorgensen technique. It was developed by Keith Jorgensen, who was the guy that was the visiting professor in Kansas City that led to us doing the trial when we were standing in the operating room talking to each other. We get stitches on either side of this kind of, we create a saddle, what we call the saddle stitch now, and then we use a wire or needle to go through the stomach and put a wire in there exactly where we want. And then we'll pass a wire through the needles, just, just like we would if we were putting a center line in. Then the needle comes out. Then we just use sequential dilators to make that track big enough to allow us to put the, the uh, button, the balloon button over the wire and into the stomach. So the, that shows the wire and the, and the needle. And you'll see the dilators going in to stretch the track up. And this is pretty, you know, it's just right along the greater curve. So we should be, there should be no tension pulling down on, on the angle of his where this button is going. So you see there's a little white dilator. I'm going to put a bigger dilator in. This is Whit Holton, who was my mentor. He liked to leave the bigger dilator in for like 15 seconds because it doesn't stretch the track up the order. So, so I think that's why we. And then the button goes in over that. And that's the button being filled with, with water. And that's what holds the stomach up to the abdominal wall. Oh, that's not true. These stitches hold the stomach up to the abdominal wall, but these stitches come out in five days. And then, the, then it's the, the, button, the button that holds it up there. And it also holds the button in once the, the stomach's healed up. So it doesn't come Let me just tie the stitches. And that's it. They can use this button when they get back up the floor immediately. Okay, thank you for attention. We've got about seven or eight minutes for, for questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A couple things about, you have a very fragile population. Um, so we all would drop in sufflation pressure for sure because the vast majority of your patients are so venous, dependent on venous return, right? And when you, when you insufflate the abdomen, you put, if you put 12 centimeters of pressure in there, you're gonna lose your venous return and that population doesn't tolerate it at all. So we all drop in sufflation pressure significantly. I usually start my insufflation pressure at around eight. We looked at, at your population early on, the single ventricle population, um, and there's there's different you know there's, there's different cardiac surgeons around the country. Some cardiac surgeons are like, I don't care. I have a single ventricle kid. I want that kid to be wrapped because he's too at risk for a vagal event and a vagal event in that population the patient dies. So we looked at open versus lap, and what we found was um, early on in the lap experience we had a lot of problems in terms of managing that, that pressure because the pressure was too high. Late in the lap experience, we had way less problems and the operation got a lot faster because we weren't doing that dissection. So, we, you know, in a, in a experienced hands, let's say, you know, Craig and I are doing a lap bundle in a single ventral. We probably can do that lap bundle in 30 minutes now. We can't do an open bundle in 30 minutes anymore. And we would do it at pressures that are you know, around 8 to 10 instead of at 15 or something like that. So I don't think that we should not be doing lap bundles in, in your patient population, but I do think you want to have an experienced group of people that understand exactly what you're describing. Don't have a new person coming in and get put the pressures where they put it for every other patient, because then you get, you get crashed. But I mean, I remember several patients that were coding, and one patient got crashed on the ECMO during a lap during, during a lap bundle early on. So great question, Christina. Uh, if they don't have a high hernia, I do it just like a child. And we had a we had a, a we had a, a, an arguing session at Sages two years uh, three years ago with Dan Smith, who's a very well known adult person, and he was arguing for maximal dissection because he had to because he was assigned that topic. <laughs> um, but at the end, we I asked him. I said, "So if you're having if you do this operation now, you do a max dissection." And he looked at me. He goes, "I think." The adults are even starting to recognize that if you don't have a hiatal hernia, you shouldn't do this huge dissection that Denise Drew used to describe. So if there's no hiatal hernia, a hiatal hernia is all bets are off because you, know, you got to get the stomach back down into the abdomen. You, you have to reconstruct the, you know, the diaphragm with the stomach where it belongs. So those patients are going to have that 15 to 20 percent failure. You just got to tell the families up front about that. But if I have a teenager that has reflux and a stricture, yeah, I would do minimal dissection. Absolutely, Craig. 
The bronchoscopy is awesome if you can get them to do it right, because if you show a little late in mac macrophages, it's a done deal. So that child needs a fun dose. I think they all need swallowing studies, and the main reason I think they need swallowing studies is going to tell you if you have to do gastrostomy with it. Because if they can't swallow, then they can't. You, get, you got to stop the reflux, but you also have to get them out to eat. Um, so for patients that I'm, if I know the child's going to get a fundal plication, then I don't do bronchoscopy. But if there's a question about, okay, the child needs a G-tube because they're not swallowing right, and there's this question about if, are these recurrent pneumonias related to reflux versus swallowing problems, then I'll do a bron ask for a bronchoscopy to take a look at the different Lois? Is it meaningful to just check the tube before you do the uh, it's a great question. We don't do it. I don't know if they do. You guys know if they do in adult population? I don't think they do, right? If they get a fundo in the adult population with no Barrett's ahead of time, do they get, do they get serial endoscopies? I would bet not because none of us want to put a scope through our, right, through our fundo. <laughs> what that least? Right, yeah. 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 Talk about doing fundos for uh, all of these. Uh, so they happen in so that's always a good question you have to tell the parents parents like what's going to happen with my child after they get their fundal plication but the fundal grows with them you know just it's no different than if you we do it i mean they never if they're going to, if they're going to develop symptoms it's going to be right away um in terms of are they going to be problematic as they get older they won't be problematic but they'll have the same issues that we do in adults so i tell all my families that there's a good chance that your child won't be able to throw up, right? Well, what happens when we throw up? Well, the first time we throw up, we empty our stomach. And after that, we're just retching. We're not doing anything else. So, we, you know, the, if a child gets sick and feels like they're going to throw up, they will retch. They just won't be able to throw up. Occasionally, a child will be able to overcome the, the, the pressure of the fungus. So, yeah, when they go off to college and they drink too much for the first time, it's going to suck for them. But in terms, of, <laughs> in terms of, you know, having the flu and throwing up, they just won't throw up. Remember that. It's not emptying your stomach that makes you feel better, with the exception of what I just said in college. If you have the flu and you're throwing up, you're throwing up because you're having a central problem or, or you're being stimulated some way. It's not emptying your stomach that makes you feel better. It's the retching and throwing up. So they'll still retch, they just won't throw up. And just, you should tell them that. And I tell them exactly what I tell you right there. I'm going to say, yeah, your, your son is going to be 24 years old and maybe this is going to happen. This will be a good reason for you to tell him not ever let it happen, but he may. You know, they won't throw up. Occasionally, like I said, about 5% of, in my experience, of kids will overcome their wrap and be able to throw up. Tara. And in terms of uh, population health, and, uh, part of, you guys as pediatric surgeons sort of gotten together and decided these are sort of the criteria now that for this operation, which seems like you sort of that inflection point has been passed where the results of the operation are so good that is there a and we're not aggressive here either compared to where i've been before so i think there's two ways to answer your question first of all no we haven't done it we should because now we have this data. we don't have this data. we have this date the last slide which i think is the home run slide isn't going to be presented for another month so um, so that is one component. Yes, we've improved the operation and we know it can be reproduced. That's a very repro reproducible operation the way it's done now. So anybody that does laparoscopy can do that operation because we're not doing, there's no, we've gotten rid of the subjective side of, oh, did I mobilize enough esophagus? Did I not mobilize enough esophagus? Now we just don't touch it, right? So there's that component. And then there's still the people out there that want to do gastrojejunosity tubes. For some reason, they just think, oh, I don't, and I know why they do it because the operation was so terrible before. So there's still a, a cohort of individuals that want to study a randomized controlled trial looking at gastrojejunosity tubes for reflux disease versus fundal plication. I'm not sure I can, I try not to ever be biased. You know, I've been part of 30 plus randomized controlled trials and I try to always walk into everyone not being biased. But I'd be hard pressed to not be biased in that operation because the results of the gastrojejunosity tubes are just so poor. But until that, so, so that core of people comes to an agreement that the fundal plication is a better thing than gastrojejunosity or nasal duodenal tubes, I think we're going to be hard pressed to get 
the consensus around that. So we may end up having to do a trial looking at gastro J versus uh, versus what? Yeah. I mean, if I had a five year old that was on Prosec right now and I'm, I'm on Prosec safe, but I'm not sure if I have a choice between doing a wrap and eliminating the, fun, the reflux disease or knowing that they're going to be on Prosec for the next 70 years. Um, I, I, I would lean towards, now I'm a surgeon, right? But I would lean towards wrap. But that's your point, right? What's the long term expense that we're not, that we're not seeing or not taking into account? But I do think as pediatric surgeons, and I'd love any other pediatric surgeons in the room to chime in if they, they feel differently, but I think at some point we're going to have to address this gastrogeogenostomy versus fundal plication for reflux disease because there's, there's a core of gastroenterologists and there's still a core of surgeons that, that, that haven't bought into the fundal plication thing. Yet, so. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, hypothetical patient, let's say I consult you for a a neurologically devastated kid is still having reflux problems after a fundo, um, and you know, an upper GI shows it's slipped. What do you do? Go, yeah, good question. <laughs> um, so go back and redo the fundo. And I do it laparoscopically. Um, almost certainly the highest is going to have to be reconstructed, and we put some sort of synthetic material or biosynthetic material around to reconstruct the highest to give it, give it some more strength. And I would do that for the second time. Once you have a once you have a slipness in the it's kind of the rule of three. So 30% of them are gonna come back with another one, and 30% of them are gonna come back with another one. Because once you get once the hiatus has been stretched out and you have that that incompetency, it happens. So I I offer three laparoscopic fundal plications before I go to an open one. And then in the open one, I, I usually do some pretty aggressive um, uh, esophageal reconstruction, or if it's a neurologically devastated child, then we we'll start talking about you know esophageal gastric disconnection. We just take the esophagus completely off the stomach and sew a little tiny pouch of small bowel up there so they can't reflux. And you just you feed. You still have a gastrostomy in the stomach, so you can feed the stomach. It's just disconnected from the esophagus, and they can still swallow because it goes right into the small bowel. But you take away the reflux entirely. Um, that's you know. If he was having, if it was a neurologically devastated kid, and even after the second one, they're having bad complications related to the reflux, then I think you'd have to be thinking about moving on and, and just abandoning the stomach as, as a route of the reservoir, especially if they're not eating. Um, I, it's been a long time since I've done a four time redo. Um, it's probably been 10 years since that's happened for me personally. I don't know if I've ever done one for myself. I've done other, you know, people, other people's, but I've done three time redos of my own for sure. <laughs> That's what I would do, though. So that is question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.